We are back on Morning Line talking about truth in sentencing, juveniles, uh, you know, the Supreme Court saying Tennessee too harsh. They have to have an opportunity as opposed to being sentenced to prison for life. Um, with us, David Rabin, of course. Um, we've got a few more phone calls here. Let's go to Wayne and see what he thinks. Wayne, good morning. Hi, Wayne. Hey, how you doing there? Good morning. Hey, I just, good morning. Hey, I just want, I just got a comment. As a parent, uh, I was, I was vilified for disciplining my children. And, uh, and I think that if you want to, if you want to stop some of this wayward, wayward behavior that we're facing right now, They've got to quit vilifying good parents who just want to discipline their children. You mentioned Cain and Abel a little while ago. Now, and, and, and we've got God's name on our money. Now, there's a scripture in Proverbs, I think it's 13 and 24 is one of them. It says that we should not spread a rod. We got leaders, powerful leaders like Phil, uh, no, no yeah, Dr. Phil, who, who, who suggests that spanking is, is obsolete and no longer needed. But... You know, it may be for some children, but not for all. And I think if you if you really want to curb some of this, we got to set guidelines. Young, stop vilifying parents that, that that will use the rod. Go in and investigate to see if there's really abuse going on, and then get out of the parents' way because we're we're, we're allowing society to uh, take a downturn. Okay, David. I mean, the thing is, uh, my take is that there aren't enough parents like him who care about disciplining their child however they do it without abuse there's just too many absent parents and these kids running wild that have no guidance and that's well, the problem I, I will tell you what that gentleman said that i have every confidence that his children are not going to be going out committing crimes because what we see is children with no parents right children with no le leadership they go out and they join gangs because they have to have somebody there this gentleman is exactly the kind of parent that we need in terms of being appropriately strict with your children maybe uh, you know disciplining them as a parent has the right to do in an appropriate way but you want to have the parents and we need to support the parents at every turn uh, the schools need to support the parents and 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 that is where Every educator will tell you, and in an idea with the criminal justice system a lot, the kids that I see, they have no parents. They have nobody showing them what to do. And if you have good role model models, mm -hmm. then you're going to avoid a lot of this aberrant behavior. That's where you start this. So you go bring the juvenile court judge in here and ask her what she thinks. She's going to tell you exactly the same thing. By the time she gets a hold of somebody, it may be too late. Mm. Where's mom and dad? So the question that you ask about those 15-year-olds who kill the market owner, you know, we should do this and we should do that. Where are the parents? What happened to them? And so you may want to have the parents be potentially, hold the parents accountable. You have situations where people, young people, very young people commit crimes with their parents' guns. Yeah. Well, maybe you want to hold the parent accountable yeah. for making that gun accessible to, to a minor, perhaps. So he has a great point, and then we ought to be looking at that as a, as a possible solution, of course. Let's go to Thomas. Thomas, good morning. Hi, Thomas. Hey, good morning, people. Uh, this question is uh, for your guest. Is it true that you can conceal carry a gun in Tennessee without a permit? I'll wait for your answer, then I've got another comment. <laughs> Okay, the answer is you cannot conceal a weapon in mm. Tennessee without a, a, a concealed permit. We have an open carry. I guess I can be running around with a gun walking down the street. But if I want to hide my pistol in my pocket and conceal it, I'd have to have a concealed carry permit. Okay. That's, what, that's the law. And I'm not sure where he was going on that. Did we have another caller on five you want me to take? Tom, go ahead, Tom. Are you there, Tom? Hello. Hey, go ahead, sir. Uh, yes, how are you doing, Nick? Good. I was sitting here listening to all this comment and stuff, and I liked the guy's comment there just a minute ago. Uh, you know, the government is what's ruining the children because they took all the, uh, you know, years ago, uh, if your kid got out and got in trouble, the parents would have to pay for the charges. And, you know, they don't, they took the discipline away from the parents so they can't, 
make their kids mine, and then kids go out here and get in trouble, the parents get in trouble. You know, it didn't make no sense when they started changing all these laws around. And yes, I've been in prison myself. Mm-hmm. I've seen children in there, 16 years old, 17 years old, and went in there, and it's not a funny thing to talk about on TV, but still, when they come back, they had no homes, no parents, no nothing out there, and they'd come back to prison because they didn't have nowhere to go, because all their friends was in there, and they was building up gangs and, you know, and stuff like that, and that was their family. That's all they know. You kind of touched on I, that. I, I, you, you know, many of these facilities are just schools for crime. Mm -hmm. Where you have that. I mean, if we can have a, a better structure for the children when they come out, uh, you know, maybe you have foster care for juveniles when they're paroled or something like mm -hmm. that to have so, some sort of structure. I mean, it's been repeatedly shown that if you have structure, uh, discipline for children, and role models in schools and stuff and churches, the, you know, the church mm -hmm. system should also be part of this. Where that's strong and in place, the number of crimes committed by juveniles are far, far less. But where you just think anything goes, there's no strictures, no rules, then anything goes. And you lose respect for authority, you, you lose respect, and ultimately you, you, you lose sensitivity for another person. It's not just worrying about, am I going to get call, caught? It's, look what I'm doing to another person. I'm harming another person. Mm -hmm. And if they see that another person is nothing but a video game, mm -hmm. they're not going to have the same empathy and commit crimes like that. And that really is the core issue. Yeah. Um, have you been, you've been in juvie court before where sometimes you see some of these youngsters, 14, 15, I've been in there. And when they go up before the, the judge, when I was 14, 15, I would have been terrified. I have a different background upbringing. Their eyes are dead sometimes. I, I'm telling you, I've seen some of these youngsters there looking at the judge. They're not showing fear. They're not showing anything. It's just, and it's almost like they're just dead. It's like they're not even comprehending where they are, and they don't really care. And I'm like, how did they get to that point? They weren't born that way. No, no, they, they, they weren't born that way, and that's an excellent point. The kids are products of their environment. Mm -hmm you know where they have no family and they're constantly abused and they have to struggle and they they grow up and all they hear is gunfire outside their door and their cousins are shot and killed and people are dying in the streets and stuff like that i mean they're they're, they're like living in a concentration camp of course their eyes are dead when they come to court because they've had a whole lifetime of this so maybe if we can change some, some modification, instead of building prisons, maybe you could have facilities where kids can go or something like this and have stronger after school activities, that kind of thing. I'm not naive, that's not the solution for all of it. But spending billions of dollars, we incarcerate more people in Tennessee the rate of incarceration in Tennessee is higher than almost any other democracy in the world. We've got more people in jail than in Tennessee than the entire continent of Australia has, with four times the population. And, and Tennessee tops the states in the country in that well, regard. We're in the top. We're in the top ten. It's mostly uh, yeah in terms of rates of incarceration. Uh, when you're talking about per hundred thousand, we incarcerate certain. The the, the racial disparity is astronomical. Um, I don't have exact statistics there, but the racial disparity is enormous um, in, in Tennessee. We have a small, we have about four million people in Tennessee, so you're talking about the rates of incarceration are much higher than in other places. But what I look forward to is some consideration on the law enforcement side and in the district attorney side. I mean, you know, Glenn Funk and I have been at mm -hmm. odds about a thousands of things, but, but he does use good judgment in many cases I've seen where there are some mitigating factors involved in that, and he makes some appropriate decisions mm -hmm. in certain kinds of cases. Um, and the new district attorney they had in Memphis campaigned on that, and they got rid of the one that was, was just artificially wooden. Mm -hmm. So 
you can, you know, you can have some situations where you have a conversation between the district attorney and the law enforcement um, and, and the judges and the people in the world talking about what's appropriate, community oh, involvement. And that's what, as we wrap it up, I hope that's the message that folks lead with, with the Supreme Court ruling and beyond that. Bottom line is you can keep building, right, Dave, in more prisons and locking people up. The crime rate's not changing. People are still committing crimes. It's not getting better. It's not a deterrent. If you don't address that, I mean, you're just going to keep locking more and more people up at already a record level and pay for more prisons. Something else has to give because all these prisons and locking folks up is not changing the crime rate. It's not going to change the crime rate and you're going to be back to where we were in 1986. Where, where at some had, point you have riots in prison and you have an instability in the criminal justice system. And you and predict that's coming. It will happen. It's not a prediction. It's an absolute certainty. I've lived it. And to me, that that's the worst thing because it creates an instability and in the people don't have confidence anymore. They're losing confidence in the government all around. We should have confidence. Truth in sentencing means accuracy in sentencing and stability in sentencing. You could create a system, it's pretty simple to just say you will serve X number of months and that's it. And then you will not get out until that time is served. And everybody can understand that, and everybody can accept that. It, you change the laws every year, you create instability, and people lose confidence in the system. And that's dangerous. David? Instructional. Thank you for asking. Someday you, you should come. write a book. I probably will. Thank David you. David Raven, thank you for coming on. We'll talk again. Great thank program. You, sir. I'll be back to wrap things up right after this.